Unfortunately, within the region of the world where I'm living in, um, we'd have the largest burden of um, gonorrhea, so in the Western Pacific and Southeast Asia. We also know that gonorrhea is a superbug in every sense of the word. Um, since antibiotics have been widely available, um, gonorrhea has acquired resistance to almost all classes of antib antibiotics. And this is uh, a famous uh, figure um, from Magnus um, and showing basically that we are running out of antibiotics and at some stage we will reach this untreatable gonorrhea if we don't do anything different. Um, I just want to give you a few highlights from the papers in a special issue and kind of entice you to, to read our special issue. Um, so just very briefly, um, so Bob Kakauti, um talks about the global um, epidemiological overview of um, this uh, growing threat of gonorrhea and sort of emphasizes um, disproportionate burdens amongst men who sex with men, um, transgender individuals, um, racial ethnic minorities, indigenous populations, sex workers, and international travelers. And it's a really uh, great piece um, to summarize all that data. Uh, Magnus wrote a, a paper for us about um, describing the WHO's um, gonococcal antimicrobial surveillance program, which you will hear about a bit more later. Um, Lou and his work um, and his colleagues examined um, gonorrhea management in the hospital systems in Australia and suggested some sort of quality control parameters that we could use. Um, the other kind of um, topics are from Sammy Gottlieb, also from WHO, who provides a review of uh, promising vaccine candidates for gonorrhea. So this is one of the exciting areas of development. Um, Tiffany Phillips and Eric Chow from Melbourne Sexual Health Centre um, summarizes our current knowledge about using mouthwash as a way to prevent gonorrhea. Um, and uh, we've also got papers from Hall, uh, who describes a genotypic mark is for resistance to fluoroquinolones and macrolides, um, which are, is really important for um, developing better diagnostics. Um, Deng et al. also um, has a systematic review in our special issue looking at um, targets for molecular assays. And both of these are really important as we think about diagnostics. Um, Buckley's study um, uses whole genome sequencing, which is a new technology, newish technology, um, to think about how do we investigate treatment failures. Um, so that, that's also a quite an exciting frontier. Uh, Mensworth Review um, talks about this uh, ongoing debate about the role of azithromycin um, in gonorrhea management, and it's a really practical kind of uh, uh, review to, to think about this, um, the role of azithromycin. And David Lewis uh, reviews the search for new agents and talks about the pipeline. And essentially, he says it's disappointingly sparse at the moment. And finally, um, Adam, uh, Adam's work is a model um, of MSM in London. Um, using uh, modeling to show point of care testing that discriminates ciprofloxacin strains. And this could be part of our strategy as part of antibiotic stewardship. And you'll hear a bit more today about that. So that's all I'm going to say about the special issue, but um, please do have a look at it. Um, and as I said, this is open access. So this is freely available to, to anyone to access. And just a, a quick plug as well, we've got another special issue which we are working on. So if you do have any uh, research related to ending HIV AIDS in the Asia Pacific region, we would love to hear from you. Um, so you can go onto the, the website of Sexual Health Journal. Um, our submission deadline is on the 15th of July. So with that, thank you very much. I'll pass um, the time now to Tio. Teo, I'm going to assign you the role. One moment, please. Teo, you should be able to present your slides. So are you able to see my slides now? No, we're not, Teo. Oh, then why is it so? Let me see.
Yeah. Are you able to see now? Yes, yes now this is visible. So thank you very much. I think, uh, Jason, uh, I would like to thank you specifically for really trying to push this um, this supplement and also uh, trying to nag me to organize this uh, webinar. And I would like to thank um, uh, Christopher and Magnus and also uh, David, who really was willingly to, uh, uh, wanting to share their expertise in uh, in this webinar. So uh, I would like to present to you uh, this WHO framework for addressing AMR in gonorrhea. And, and we know from Jason already, as he was saying, that this is really a big issue. And in our current uh, global strategy uh, for STIs, we have really prioritized gonorrhea uh, as an area of work that we would like to, um, uh, to really focus on and here we have a very ambitious goal of ending STI as a public health threat by 2030. And one of the biggest incidence and prevalence indicator that we have is really to make sure that we reduce Neisseria gonorrhea incidence by 90% by 2030. To be able to do this, we need to make sure that we address the risk of resistance and the risk of having untreatable gonorrhea. We do have a framework uh, for a global action to control the spread of and impact of AMR in Nigeria gonorrhea, which is very much linked to the global action plan of AMR resistance. And one of the biggest area of work that we are looking into at the moment, aside from advocacy and capacity building, is to really strengthen the gonococcal antimicrobial surveillance program so that this could be able to inform us in terms of treatment guidelines and also policies uh, to control uh, the spread and impact of AMR in gonorrhea. Of course, very big into our agenda is making sure that we address the overall STI and prevention and control, which I think Chris will give his input into this in, uh, later on. One of the areas of work uh, that we are also looking at is the development of new gonorrhea treatment and looking at how we can then also uh, ensure that we conserve our current antibiotics and the new antibiotics that we are going to be developing by developing a point of care test for gonorrhea that can identify gonorrhea and differentiate it from glamidia as well as to look at AMR detection. And overall, I think the area of work on gonorrhea vaccine is also something that we are trying to facilitate. Just a little word on the Global Antimicrobial Surveillance Program. As you will know, the, the GASP has been in existence since 1990s, before even the Global Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Program, which we call GLASP. And if you look at this GLASS system, that is a global initiative to uh, look at AMR surveillance, one of the priority pathogens that they have is also looking at surveillance of uh, gonorrhea resistance. So at the moment, the GAS program is uh, very much closely linked to the current GLASS system that we have. In addition to that, we have a special program that we are now trying to initiate, which is also part of the GLASS system. And this is what we call the enhanced GAS system, where we are having sentinel countries to collect more data and link epidemiological data to the laboratory data that we have so that we have more meaningful data moving forward. Another area of work that we are looking at is trying to facilitate the development of new gonorrhea treatment. We know for a fact that in the future, we will run out of uh, drugs for gonorrhea. And as early as now, we have really partnered with the Global AMR Research and Development um, Program within WHO uh, to really develop this new gonorrhea treatment and look at it and ensure that we have a new gonorrhea treatment that we can be provided uh, moving forward. So within this framework, we are not just looking at developing the drug, but to look at how this drug 
can be integrated to our guidelines and to the essential medicine list that we have, but also to ensure an access strategy. We know that we need to have this new drug and make it accessible, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we conserve this so that uh, we are not going to be developing resistance very fast with this new treatment that we will be having. Another area of work that we are really looking at, of course, is how do we delay antimicrobial resistance? And I think developing STI case management guidelines is so essential so that we are able to have effective and appropriate treatment um, for gonorrhea, but also looking at the entire STI case management guidelines that we have and making sure that we make sure to integrate some of the issues related to the point of care test. Currently, if you look at this slide, if we had a vaginal discharge in women, for a thousand women complaining of vaginal discharge and a 5% gonorrhea and or chlamydial infection, if we were just going to be sticking with syndromic approach, among these 500 women who has vaginal discharge, we will only be able to effectively treat them for gonorrhea and chlamydia for about 12, per, uh, 12 of them. And we will be over treating 409 of them. We will be missing 38 cases. And we, in, with this, 12 PID will be developed. But if we included a point of care test uh, within this framework, you will know that we will be able to effectively treat 44 more women, we will have less overtreatment, and of course, we will have less uh, mistreatment, and we will only have uh, uh, two uh, PID at the moment. The problem with this that we have at the moment is that I cannot move my slide forward. Is that uh, with this, I think uh, what's going to happen is that with this, uh, if we had a point of care test, we will be able to avert 316 over treatment overall. So what we are also trying to do is develop a point of care test for gonorrhea and chlamydia in low and middle income countries. We know for a fact that we have near point of care tests like gene expert or the big technology, but this may not be very much affordable in, in low and middle income countries. So we are now working and partnering with some of our partners like FINE to find a way uh, to have cheap point of care tests. And if you look at this uh, framework that we have, we are also trying to develop and see how we can be optimizing Later, lateral flow diagnostic at the moment to increase its sensitivity and specificity. It might not be a perfect um, model where it's probably going to be less specific and sensitive, but at least we have something that can be used for low and middle income countries and also to develop other molecular uh, testing that could be of low, um, low cost. In addition, I think at the moment, we also need to be thinking how we can be uh, having and already opportunistically be using near point of care tests uh, moving forward while we await some of these new uh, cheap point of care tests that we are trying to Another thing that we are looking at at the moment is, oh, sorry. is the development of, um, of vaccines. And I think this is an area of work uh, that WHO is also looking at. It's going to be another 10 years uh, to be able to develop a vaccine. But we are now trying to look at how this can be facilitated. And as you well know that the study done, for example, in, in New Zealand gives us more hope when a an outer membrane vesicular meningococcal vaccine has also some protection against gonorrhea, and now there's a clinical phase 
two trials that is looking at Dexero uh, to look at its effectiveness to also uh, 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 be something that could be used for gonorrhea vaccine. So I think these are some of the WHO initiatives that we have. And moving forward, I think we can have more discussion regarding this. Thank you very much. So over to uh, Christopher at the moment. Thank you. Uh, I have changed over to Chris Farley, please. Yes. Okay, so now I'm to share my slides. It's Kip Farley, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, let me just work out. Uh, Can you see a share content button? Yep, perfect. So is that the whole slide share or just the... Um, uh, maybe if you go into presentation mode, that will be helpful. Is that better? Yep, great, the floor is yours, Kip, thanks. Right. Well, look, thank you, um, Meg, and thank you, Jason. Um, it's a it's a privilege. I've not done one of these before. Uh, so good morning, good night, good afternoon around the world. I want to spend the next 15 minutes just talking a little bit about gonorrhea control and prevention. And I apologise if it's um, too simple for some in individuals. I tried to make it uh, generally accessible. So I'm going to talk about very briefly the reproductive rate because with COVID, I'm sure you've had that shoved down your throat many times already. We'll talk about what determines that in a sexually transmitted infection sense, which of these factors are easy to change and which are hard and which are impossible. And then some new data to make it just a little bit more complicated. So the reproductive rate is the number of secondary infections you get from every existing infection. So if you want something to die out in a population, you need to create a reproductive rate where one infection leads to less than one infection. And for a sexually transmitted infection, that really means you only have three options. You can change the probability of the transmission of that infection per partnership. You can change the rate of partner change in the population, or you can do something about the duration of infectiousness, which really means doing something about the, the treatment. And if you think of it conceptually, there's only those three things that you can do if you want to, in inverted commas, control gonorrhea. So uh, uh, here's one of the rare aeroplanes still flying in the world. This is an A380. And um, what it's doing is it's, it's bringing into a population of people who lived in Melbourne in 2005, heterosexuals, 10 plane loads of gonorrhea. And because the reproductive rate on the left-hand left side is less than one, doesn't actually matter how many infectious individuals you bring into the population because you've created a scenario where the reproductive rate's less than one, so they just die out. And so the purple line, which is the infections that are introduced, just dies away. In contrast, in indigenous populations in Australia, the reproductive rate for gonorrhea is more than one. So you only have to introduce one single case and you'll get an epidemic and then you'll get endemic continued transmission. So the key for us as public health people, clinicians, whatever, is how do I tweet the, the, tweet the situation so that uh, my population has a reproductive rate of less than one? And if you can do that, you can control gonorrhea. So that might be, for example, to increase condom use. Now, you might do that by making it freely available in every shop there is. You might be able to reduce the partner number in the population, or you might be able to reduce the duration of infectiousness by providing accessible health services. So if you can change some of those things, you'll reduce the prevalence. If you get below one, you can concentrate on something else. So the problem is though, that um, there are lots of people on the planet. And the reason there are lots of people on the planet is we're biologically programmed to like two things. We like having sex and we like eating. So that, that means that those two things, the beta and the, and the C, that's the number of partners and the pleasure we derive from sex transmissibility, are much more difficult to change than access to healthcare. So when thinking about controlling gonorrhea, 
think more about access to healthcare than the others. I'm going to give you an example now that illustrates that point. This publication now is more than 20 years old, but it was a really important publication. It, it was a randomized control trial down many different centers, and it compared a two minute didactic information se session on what an STI is and so forth by a clinician. And then it, it, the other group were, were two 20 minute sessions by a counselor, which really focused on the, the latest way to change behavior. So to support the patient and patient initiated behavior, et cetera. So they compared well, the, 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 what's done in an SDI center perhaps, and then what's best practice. And what they showed 12 months later is that they could increase condom use to 100% in 38% of the participants who had five minute didactic consultations, but only 44% in those that had the 20 minute session. So that big increase in time and counseling resulted in a 6% increase in condom use. And unfortunately that was at 12 months and it decays over time. So you can't just leave it there forever, you have to keep doing it. And the STI rated follow-up was about 14.5% in the five minute and 12% in the other. And that's not a very big difference. And again, you have to keep doing it if you want it to have an effect. So, so you can increase condoms a bit. And this is a meta-analysis of publications there. You can have a look at it in due course. It essentially shows that if you try and remove pleasure from people, you try and get them to use a condom, it's expensive, it takes a lot of money, and it's hard to sustain, and the effect size is very small. But what you can't do is you can't reduce partner number. But by counseling people, you can't reduce the number of partners that they have. There are other ways to reduce partner number that I'll deal with in a minute, but you can't encourage people to reduce partner number. It's very difficult and it doesn't really work. But what you can do is you can provide access to healthcare. And this is a slide of syphilis and the same is true for gonorrhea as well. But it illustrates the magnitude of the strength of providing access to healthcare for the control of sexually transmitted infections. So if you look then at syphilis, you see it went up before the war, all the young people didn't want to diverge and so they went off and found sex workers. But after penicillin was introduced, look at the one in women, the dotted line. It fell down to a very low level and it's never essentially recovered. There was some increase in men, which was reflecting in men of sex and men, but essentially it never recovered. The, the reduction in the 80s and 90s was the tragedy of, of HIV, but, but access to healthcare has a huge effect and it's a behavior that's, that's reasonably easy to sustain. This is an example of a mathematical model for gonorrhea that illustrates exactly the same point. The solid line is the rate of endemic gonorrhea and heterosexuals in a population, and the dotted line is the health services that you provide to that population. If you increase it by 10%, graph A, 20%, graph B, 30%, graph C, and 50%, graph D, you'll see in all cases gonorrhea rate falls. But when you move from 10% to 20%, you actually cross the reproductive rate. So you get this massive fall in infections that occurs. And so the only infections that are really occurring are imported cases from other countries that don't have it under control. But the single most important bit of this slide is if you look at D, the amount of healthcare you have to provide when it's not controlled is more than you have to provide once you have controlled it. So the key is, get your reproductive rate less than one and then provide enough healthcare, which will be less than you had to provide before, to keep it under control. So just to review what I've said already, if you look at it from the reproductive rate perspective, you can increase condom use, it's expensive, it's hard, it's difficult to sustain. At very least, you should have condoms highly accessible. And that means you should have them in vending machines, and supermarkets and all sorts of other, other places. The rate of partner change is really hard to change when you educate people. I'm going to come to how you can change it in a minute, but when you approach it from an education, you really shouldn't have as many partners, you really shouldn't eat too much, doesn't work. 
But by far the easiest thing to do is to ensure your country, your community, your city, whatever it is you're looking after, has accessible health care so symptomatic individuals can get treated and the transmission can be terminated. So, so I'm going to give you some other examples about the importance of access to health services because the head has a profound effect on a whole lot of different sexually transmitted pathogens as, as, as well. So here's the tragedy in the US of access to HIV testing, HIV treatment, the testing and treatment for sexually transmitted infections and pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis for, H for HIV. You'll see that white women in the light blue who have no more sexual partners and use condoms no differently to black women have a rate nearly a thirtieth as high as black women. So these people are not in a way making a choice uh, to get these infections. It's the popular, the, the community, the government is not providing them with the health services they need to control those infections. And the tragedy, so, so it, is, it is not nearly as simple as that though. Um, so you have to provide accessible condoms, you have to provide uh, accessible health care. Well, it's a little bit more complicated for men of sex with men. For heterosexuals, it really is that simple, um, sub subject to making a, a, um, a, a, a population that has a sense of equality. If you don't have equality, everything goes fast. So um, for, for healthcare work, it's really about making uh, people with symptoms able to access healthcare. And the reason that's important is because men and women have sex. The penis almost always goes inside the vagina during sex. Men and all of men and 50% of women are always accessible. There's a reasonably high level of partner notification. So you basically get people treated if you have accessible healthcare. For men of sex with men, it's much more complicated. So here's a graph, um, it's by age, but it doesn't matter. At some of the different sexual practices that, that occurred in the last sexual act between two men. So mostly they kissed, a minority had receptive anal sex, some had inserted anal sex, and some have oral sex and some gave oral sex. So not everybody has the one act. But it's actually more, more important than that. While the penis is infected in some of those interactions, often the infection occurs in the throat, which is always asymptomatic and invisible unless tested, or in the anus, which is mostly asymptomatic. So unless you get a penis involved when two men who have sex, access to healthcare isn't nearly as critical as it is in uh, heterosexuals. And so for men of sex with men, they have lots of different types of sex, they have lots of asymptomatic sites. Because there's so much stigma with men who have sex with men, there's much men, there's much less contact tracing that occurs. There's more partners that occur, occur as a result of the stigma. And it's actually quite complicated to understand the transmission between all these different sites. What you mustn't do is develop this simplistic, oh, it's your fault that you caught this. Because remember, the biggest determinant of an STI prevalence is not someone's choice, it's actually the healthcare services or the government's decision to provide access to healthcare to that population. So whatever we do, we can't go through this, it's your fault sort of scenario. So it's important to get rid of stigma as much as you possibly can because stigma is about the only thing you can do to reduce partner number. It has many effects, it increases partner number significantly, it reduces condom use, it reduces, it increases anonymous partners, which means partner notification goes down, increases um, substance abuse. So if you can get rid of some of the stigma, you will get rid of a lot of the STI risk associated with sex between men. So, so there are very serious uh, questions asked about the transmission of gonorrhea at the moment that can't, the epidemiology can't explain. It's described, I think, quite well in this article, albeit that I actually wrote, recently published in um, the journal on the right hand side there. Have a read of that. It's much more complicated than just the penis putting in the throat and the anus and vice versa. And it was debated recently at the uh, Vancouver conference at the ISTDR la last year. So just to summarize, as I come close to my uh, 15 minute time slot. Try very hard to avoid blame. 
Remember, people get STIs because of poor government policy. They don't get STIs because of people's choices <coughs> to use condoms or have partners. Whatever you do, try and get rid of stigma in your population. Treat everyone as equal and try and make a great sense of equality in that population. You must, if you want to control gonorrhea, provide accessible health care. And people need to understand when they should access their health care, what symptoms are important. You need to provide all the basic public health strategies that in this short talk I can't deal with, but deal with part notification, accessibility, condoms and so forth. Most importantly, you also have to keep, particularly in men and sex with men, an open mind and watch this space because there's a lot of articles coming out about that at the moment. So as I come up to 15 minutes, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kit. Um, I can't see any clarifi quick, uh, clarification questions in the chat box. Um, there was one comment, though, regarding um, R0 and just the role of condoms and accessing correct treatment. And the context is within Papua New Guinea, um, where they said there was a lot of um, high prevalence there. Um, but yeah, so I'm not fully understanding that, that question from Gurunga. Um, if you like, I can have a go at it. So yeah. I think it's a question about how about improving sexual education. So, yes. so okay. education is really important. It's absolutely important and there's no question about that. I, I, I think that issue that you've raised in this question about seeking health care and information status is also very important. So I agree with you that, that both of those things are important. Thanks so much, Kit. Um, let's move on to um, the next speaker. So we're going to um, ask Magnus to speak to us now. So if um, Meg could give Magnus control. Yes, he has presenter role now. Can you see my slides now? Yep, perfect, thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me to give a talk in this uh, very interesting and important. Uh, I'm not watching, now you just turned off the telly. No. Sorry, I think we can hear someone who's unmuted. Thanks for putting yourself on mute. Okay, so good morning. Can everyone go on mute, please? So thank you for the invitation to talk at this uh, symposia webinar regarding the uh, very uh, important special issue. I will give a, a very brief overview about uh, especially gonococcal antimicrobial resistance uh, surveillance. As uh, Jason already showed, it is a huge global problem uh, with gonorrhea, estimated uh, nearly 87 million cases in adults in 2016, which uh, translates into a global prevalence of 0.9%. Uh, uh, but as you can see from the 95% uh, uncertainty intervals uh, going up to uh, more than 123 million cases, it's clearly, clearly a necessity to have better data to model from. It's also clear that we have a larger burden in uh, low-income countries. And as you can see on this slide, the highest number of cases are in the WHO Western Pacific region. Uh, however, this is of course affected uh, by the very large population in that uh, region. In the WHO African region, you can also see a very large number of cases and in fact, uh, uh, the largest number of cases among uh, women. And in WHO African region, uh, we really need to do more work because it's also the highest incidence uh, per population in that uh, region. 
Regarding antimicrobial resistance, as uh, probably all of you know, it uh, is a huge international problem. Uh, basically, since the introduction of the first uh, treatment, the sulfonamides in the mid-1930s, this bacteria has shown an extraordinary capability to basically accumulate uh, different resistance determinants. Uh, many resistance determinants that also affect uh, several different antimicrobial classes. And in this way, the treatment uh, recommended have been excluded in more than 80 years. And now basically we only have the ceftriaxone left as for empiric uh, monotherapy. And it's in many countries still given together with acetomycin in a dual therapy. When the first uh, high-level resistant, uh, ceftriaxone resistance, so-called superbugs, uh, uh, started to be described, uh, the first identified in 2009, WHO wrote those uh, global action plans that also uh, Theodora uh, described earlier, including many key priorities. You have the global action plan to control the spread and impact of resistance in Nicaragua gonorrhea which uh, links into the Global Action Plan uh, on Antimicrobial Resistance, discussing many key, uh, key uh, pathogens and resistance to those. Uh, one of the key priorities for Nigeria gonorrhea was to develop uh, the WHO Global Gonococcal Antimicrobial Surveillance Program, uh, which was significantly revitalized in uh, 2009 and have expanded since then. It has been two publications, and the latest publication uh, was in this special issue of sexual health, including data from 67 surveyed countries, uh, data from 2015-2016. And why do we need then uh, this, sorry, this uh, global GASP? Basically, because gonorrhea and antimicrobial resistance are clearly, as we know, global problems, but also because uh, we use different types of estimates and in general, on a global level, both infection and resistance prevalence are more or less uh, unknown in, in most countries at least. Also, gonococcal uh, and especially resistant clones clearly evolve, uh, evolve and spread nationally, regionally and globally. So this is why it was initially uh, started, uh, this uh, global GASP. And I need to strongly emphasize that this is a global WHO uh, program, but it wouldn't work uh, without a very close liaison with many excellent regional and national GASPs. Uh, here I only mention some of those long-standing partners, Eurogasp, US uh, GISP, Canadian GASP, uh, the GASP in Argentina, UK GRASP, the Australian program, and there are many uh, additional ones that have joined later on, like the uh, great uh, Brazilian GASP, uh, South African GASP, Ugandan GASP, and so on. If we look into the latest data from 2015-2016, uh, you can see uh, that the number of countries reporting resistance or decreased susceptibility is high uh, in the global level, which I will get back to. But I also want to emphasize that uh, it differs a lot, uh, the number of countries uh, that provide any data uh, every year. So the European region have had most countries uh, reporting uh, data. It was 30 countries in 2015-16. While you can see in Africa, it was only five, six countries reporting for different antimicrobials. And Eastern Mediterranean region only a single country. So we really need to focus on improving the surveillance in many of the uh, regions. Regarding countries that reported uh, decreased susceptibility or resistance to ceftriaxone, uh, it was nearly 24% of countries reporting any decreased susceptibility or resistance to this uh, last remaining option for treatment. And it was seven countries reporting more than or equal 5%. Uh, most of the uh, decreased susceptibility resistance was in the WHO uh, Western Pacific region, where traditionally a lot of resistance has emerged before it has spread uh, globally, but also in many 
other parts of the world, high income areas where we have good surveillance, uh, it's clearly a, a problem with uh, decreased susceptibility and resistance. For azithromycin, uh, nearly 81% of countries reported any resistance to azithromycin, and it was 30 countries that reported more than or equal to 5% resistance. However, this is also affected uh, by the fact that a lot of different uh, resistance breakpoints is used in the different regions. Ciprofloxacin, all countries 100% reported uh, some ciprofloxacin resistance. 65, nearly all countries reported more than or equal to 5%, and 12 countries more than or equal to 90% resistance. So clearly this is not something we can continue to use. And the problem is, uh, which I show here, that in several parts of the world, like Central America, Caribbean, uh, African region, Eastern Mediterranean region, the former Soviet republics in WHO European region, we, we have extremely limited data, and we really need to focus on uh, improving the surveillance in those regions. Because in many countries, they can still use ciprofloxacin because they don't have their own national data. So the, the limitations with the WHO Global Cost, uh, which is also the work in progress, basically what we are working with uh, every year and try to improve, is that we still have limited number of countries, particularly in uh, the WHO African and Eastern Mediterranean regions. Uh, we have made some success in Africa by successful implementation of sentinel surveillance representing different African regions. We still have a low number of isolates and suboptimal representativeness of isolates in many countries. Still, in some regions, this diffusion method instead of recommended uh, MIC determination is used. Uh, so we try to implement especially e-test in many countries. It's also a lack of a standardized global quality assurance, uh, both uh, quality controls and external quality assessment. So we try hard to introduce uh, WHO reference trains as well as <clears throat> recommend the use of validated EQA. It's also a general problem in the gonococcal resistance surveillance that we lack harmonized clinical breakpoints for a degree susceptibility or resistance. Most uh, countries use UCAST or CLSI breakpoints, which we try to push uh, harmonization of, uh, but there are still other breakpoints used. And also, uh, there are no or limited clinical and epidemiological data of patients, especially with the exception of Eurogast and US GISP. Can everyone keep on mute, please? Uh, to also try to improve the situation with the uh, lack of clinical and epidemiological data. As Theo mentioned, the EGOS program, uh, where it has been very successful, especially in Thailand and the Philippines, where you have also some of, of uh, the epi data collected. In African region, both Uganda and South Africa are close to becoming a, a, a fully implemented EGOS countries. And also, as Theo mentioned, now uh, joining uh, the WHO surveillance for resistance in many priority pathogens in the GLASS program will uh, really support the improvement and expansion of uh, WHO GASP and be very fruitful in the longer term. Very briefly, in uh, the European uh, region, we have a program including now 27 countries it's uh, funded and coordinated by ECDC with Gianfranco Piteri and outsourced to Public Health England with Michelle Cole and Michaela Day and my laboratory. Uh, as you can see, since we introduced the, the dual therapies of triaxone plus acetromycin, the cathexime resistance and initially also ceftriaxone resistance decreased rather dramatically. Uh, we initially had a, a limited increase in acetromycin resistance, which was stable between 2014 and 2017, but then in 2018 it uh, significantly increased. 
uh, it's 7.2 percent using the current ECOF uh, for acetromycin uh, non-susceptible. Now there exists no uh, resistance breakpoints for acetromycin, only ECOFs. But as we could see now in the in 2018 in Europe, we had the, again some surprise on resistance, uh, three isolates, and now it's a huge worry because now for the first time we see evidence of an international spread of obviously a biologically fit surprise on resistance strain that was initially identified in Japan, now have been identified in Canada, Australia, many European countries and especially in China, they have rather many cases. It was also the, recently in 2018, the first strain described both in UK and Australia with resistance to keftriaxone plus high level resistance to acetromycin, which is a huge worry for our last treatment options. Uh, most of those cases were also cases or contacts in uh, Asia. And uh, this is also what we really need to improve, the understanding of the uh, epidemiology in a global perspective, uh, the international spread of Neisseria gonorrhea, but also of resistance, uh, different clones, as well as spread of resistance determinants. In the European surveillance, we have included now also whole genome sequencing in the surveillance. This is a collaboration with Eurogasp uh, together with the Center for Genomic Pathy and Surveillance directed by David Arnensen and uh, Leonor Sanchez Busso is uh, the responsible for the gonococcal work now. In the first surveillance here we uh, sequenced more than 1,000 uh, consecutive Neisseria gonorrhea both resistant and susceptible ones to create a baseline of genomic diversity on Neisseria gonorrhea in Europe and this is what we really need globally, not only sequence uh, resistant isolates. We could see that the main uh, multidrug resistant clone, 1407, had decreased, uh, which we hypothesized was the effect of dual therapy targeting the reservoir in uh, MSM and in uh, pharyngeal infection. We showed the detection of all known resistance determinants and it was also developed an open access web-based application for genomic analysis and visualization, which I will get back to. In 2018 project, we now have sequenced more than 2,600 isolates from 27 countries. And there are also now, for better in understanding internationally, many national GAS that use uh, whole genome sequencing in uh, Canada as well, and as well as the US, the uh, GISP in US, uh, the Brazilian uh, National Surveillance also have included whole genome sequencing, as well as uh, the first uh, projects in Argentina. In order to uh, link uh, all these data, uh, the Neisseria gonorrhea AMR surveillance, molecular epidemiology, genome-based uh, metadata very available, it has also been uh, developed a, a so-called community-driven resource for genomic surveillance of Nicaragua gonorrhea using this Pathy and Watch uh, developed uh, as, with, by the CGPS, uh, as I mentioned, David Amundsen's uh, group, together also uh, with a scientific steering, com, uh, steering group. Uh, now there are uh, nearly 15,000 validated genomes from 27 collections from all over the world, as you can see in this uh, uh, platform, you have the collections with available uh, metadata, which are still limited, but hopefully we can improve the metadata in many parts of the world. You get the traditional typing uh, systems, MLST, NGSTAR, NGMAST, uh, resistance determinants, uh, as well as predicted uh, resistance. Of course, you also get uh, the uh, genome-based uh, phylogeny of uh, the different collections, and you link that to the uh, geography as well as the chronology of isolation and uh, transmission. Uh, and all this work is also clearly linked to the 
ambitions of the WHO GASP and the GLASS to initiate whole genome sequencing to further support the resistance uh, surveillance. So the conclusions of this talk is uh, that, as all of you probably know, gonorrhea and uh, natural gonorrhea resistance remain global concern. Ceftriaxone resistance ha has uh, decreased, or at least initially decreased, in many countries after introduction of ceftriaxone plus acetromycin in dual therapy, or only ceftriaxone in some countries. But now we have ceftriaxone resistant, uh, some also with concomitant acetromycin resistant strain spreading. We really need to improve the WHO global GASP, uh, which is imperative, enhance the culture capacity, introduce more molecular resistance surveillance, and most important, improve the patient's uh, metadata and get more information about uh, treatment used and treatment failures. And we think that genome sequencing really revolutionizes our understanding of both the bacteria, the epidemiology of infection, and sequela, uh, as well as Nicaea gonorrhea resistance, selection spread, fitness, including even uh, compensatory mutations. Uh, with that, I uh, finish off, and I'm happy to discuss anything further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Magnus. That was. Um the tour de force of um, all the surveillance work that's going around the world. So, and it's such a critical part of control of, of um, gonorrhea and, and infectious diseases. Um, there is only one um, question, just as a clarification. Um, where else can we access the WHO GASP resistance report? Um, you mentioned um, the latest one was published in a special issue, but um, how, how do people access the other data? Uh, I think, uh, Jason, uh, you will also note that it is available in our website. Uh, we do have all the uh, data uh, from 2009 to, uh, to, uh, to 2016. So we can give you the link for the WHO website where we try to publish our global STI surveillance report. And you can find in all these STI surveillance reports a detailed uh, description of all the countries and the percentages and, and, and all the other information regarding gonorrhea surveillance. So maybe I can include that in the link as well. So it's already included in the link, uh, which has been said it's in the Global Health Observatory. Yep, fantastic. Thanks so much, Tio. Um, and the final talk, um, actually, so this will be a tag team um, between Tio and Magnus to give um, David Lewis's talk. So um, for those who join us a bit later, unfortunately, David Lewis um, couldn't join us um, for this webinar, um, but um, Tio and uh, Magnus has, has kindly uh, will present um, the data. Um, so um, if we could give control to Tio first, thanks. Tio has presenter control now. Tio, you can just open up your slide. And a reminder for people who have their video on, please turn off your video so we can maintain bandwidth. Thank you. Yeah, there's some funky disco lights happening. <laughs> but I don't know who that person is. But um, yeah, certainly if you could turn off your video, that'll be nice. Thanks. So are you able to see my, my slides now? Uh, not yet, Tio. So how not yet, I... not yet, please. All right, let me just go back. I'm not sure how to do this now. Okay. So I have my slides here, and it doesn't share. Are you able to click on that uh, button, share content, next to the yeah, video? The one, yeah. Okay. Yep, perfect. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much. I think... Um, uh, I think I'm presenting uh, in, on behalf of David, who is currently unavailable uh, due to an emergency. 
and um, I, yeah, here I think when we look at uh, STI case management, uh, we all know that we need to start from the very start, which is really history taking, taking a clinical examination, establishing a diagnosis, making sure that we have effective uh, and early treatment. In addition to that, what's very essential is also looking at advice on sexual behavior, the promotion of condom, and whether we also need to discuss about HIV testing, as well as also the issue of trying to provide HIV PrEP. Very critical also in the STI case management package is looking at partner notification and treatment and making sure that we follow our patients. And what is always forgotten, as we mentioned, is also case reporting. The big issue with uh, sexual history taking, I think, are very, uh, very uh, numerous. And some of these issues, which I think is so critical in the management of patients, is mostly some of our colleagues, uh, our healthcare providers, really doesn't have that adequate education or training to conduct sexual health uh, education. And at the same time, um, there is always the issue of limited time, the concern of insurance for reimbursement, there's also the issue of some uh, personal uh, uh, conservative uh, uh, beliefs on sexual health. Communication skills can also be a big barrier. And there's a growing gap between the development of sexual health medicine and the clinical skills of some of our clinicians. And of course, there's always a generation obstacle and some cultural differences. For the diagnosis and treatment uh, of gonorrhea, uh, and also for STIs in particular, we have recommended syndromic approach as the main approach, especially in low and middle income countries, because they are not able to um, uh, uh, afford uh, the laboratory uh, diagnosis for STIs. And syndromic approach, really means that you base your uh, diagnosis on symptoms and signs. You also, uh, uh, it's very essential that when you say syndromic approach, it's really based on symptoms and it's not really to de detect asymptomatic cases. And also at the same time, what's very advantageous with syndromic approach is that you can provide same day treatment. However, I think in most countries, uh, there is a big issue because with syndromic approach, we are not able to uh, integrate some of the AMR surveillance data that we have uh, to really um, in, in, inform us of the diagnosis or, or the treatment that we are supposed to be providing uh, with syndromic approach. And how do we then manage uh, treatment failure with this current syndromic approach management? On the other hand, we know that etiologic approach would be the most ideal way of a diagnosis and treating our uh, cases. However, um, it is often not available in low and middle income countries. And uh, I think if you're asymptomatic, how, we, how do we then make sure that we have a right way or a cost effective way of um, detecting cases among asymptomatic individuals? And also very importantly with etiologic approach, I think is that we are able to provide the right treatment and we can then also provide uh, treatment failure management using AMR data. Again, Magnus, I think now you can uh, move forward with this one when it comes to the NAT technology. Okay, I can start here then, yep. Yes. Uh, so, so basically, the pros and cons of the NAT technology. Uh, the NAT, uh, as you know, has really revolutionized our diagnostics due to the superior sensitivity with usually maintained specificity. Uh, it has 
it's more sensitive uh, than culture uh, at all anatomical sites and especially in the pharynx and the rectum. Uh, the technology can detect both dead and live bacteria, which is also one of the basis for the high sensitivity. It's suitable for non-invasive specimens and uh, also in the way that is not uh, susceptible or sensitive to transport, you can use it for hard to reach populations. And multiplexing can, get, can reduce the cost. However, we need to keep in mind that also NATs have uh, very important disadvantages. And the most important disadvantage is that you don't get any viable bacteria for resistance surveillance, uh, resistance testing. So we need to maintain and significantly strengthen uh, the culture capacity. Uh, the other disadvantage is that you can get an inhibition in the amplification process. It's also a problem with some of the assays uh, with the lower specificity due to cross reactions with other Neisseria species which really creates a problem because uh, it significantly reduces the positive predictive value, especially in low prevalence population, which is the case for gonorrhea in many parts of uh, the world. It's also a higher cost. Slide, please. Uh, regarding emergence of resistance, as I also briefly mentioned earlier, it was a, a first case already in 2009 of high-level keftriaxone on resistance in Japan. It was a strain with an MIC of 2 to 4 milligram per liter, dependent on method used. Uh, an oropharyngeal case in a commercial sex worker in Kyoto. Fortunately, uh, there were no further sp spread of this strain uh, that could be confirmed uh, even in an intensified surveillance that uh, Dr. Makoto Nishi initiated in Kyoto and Osaka. It has also subsequently been uh, confirmed that this strain had a, a severely damaged biological fitness, uh, both uh, in vitro as well as in the mice model. Uh, however, having said that, it was also shown in the mice model that uh, compensatory mutations can restore the biological fitness. Slide, please. Uh, rather soon after, it was also described that the second high level of on resistance strain, which was initially found uh, in uh, uh, France and then uh, in Spain. In Spain, it was also important because it was the first documentation of a, a transmission of a high level of trials on resistant strains, uh, where the strain was found in uh, a couple. Um, so here we could see that it could really spread. Uh, fortunately, however, this strain has not, as far as we know, spread further, and it has also been confirmed that it has a severely damaged uh, fitness. Slide. Uh, what was also very briefly mentioned in my talk earlier, uh, the largest concern came when uh, the first strain was identified both in UK and Australia, basically isolates of the identical strain. The first strain with ceftriaxone resistance combined with a very high level of citromycin resistance, which is basically an MIC more than 256 uh, milligram per liter. Uh, to our knowledge, uh, uh, no further spread has so far been identified uh, of this strain either, uh, which is of course very uh, positive. But this was the first case when Nicaragua gonorrhea showed that it can have concomitant resistance to both the drugs in the dual therapy and the last remaining options for treatment. And as I also mentioned in the previous talk, we also have now a confirmation that it is a surprise on resistance strain spreading internationally, the so-called uh, FC428 uh, strain. Slide, please. So as early mentioned uh, for Nicaragua gonorrhea, that initially was susceptible to uh, very many uh, antimicrobial classes. Uh, now we basically have uh, uh, nothing left to treat with uh, except ceftriaxone 
and in some regions it can be supported by uh, acetromycin slide. So the discussion now is a lot uh, regarding uh, continuation with the dual therapies of triaxone plus acetromycin or as uh, some uh, countries have went back uh, to ceftriaxone monotherapy. In 2010 to 2012, many regions and countries implemented ceftriaxone plus acetromycin dual therapy in slightly different ceftriaxone doses and also acetromycin doses ranging from one to two grams. Uh, UK in 2019 uh, went back to only ceftriaxone high dose uh, therapy, uh, one gram. Uh, and in general, uh, we could say that the dual therapy clearly appears to be uh, still effective. Uh, it has uh, limited the spread of resistant strains, and also it appears like the extended uh, spectrum cephalosporin resistance has decreased. However, as uh, David points out here in his slide, there is clearly limited evidence to support uh, dual therapy and is mostly based on expert opinions that you should have at least one drug that is uh, strong enough to eradicate uh, uh, the resistant uh, strain. If it's resistant to ceftriaxone, you still have acetromycin and visa versa. The dual therapy also brings extra cost uh, and resistance to both agents already exist and we need a more holistic view. So acetromycin use for gonorrhea might also uh, affect uh, the mycoplasma macrolide uh, resistance. Briefly, I can mention that uh, in the new European treatment guideline, the idea is to uh, have keftriaxone one gram plus acetromycin two grams or in countries where you have resistant surveillance, evident, uh, evidence that you don't have any ceftriaxone resistance, you have test of cure and follow up of patients returning for test of cure. In those countries, you can use only keftriaxone one gram. The European guidelines are a bit different because they aim to recommend treatment for all the 53 WHO European uh, countries. So that's why we didn't want to exclude acetromycin completely for all countries when we know there are catrice resistant strains circulating that uh, are not eradicated with even catrice on one gram. Slide, please. It's also now a lot of uh, discussions and hope that we can use more resistance guided treatment uh, using precision guided diagnostics. Basically, uh, a treatment based on the molecular testing. Uh, so far, we only have appropriate molecular resistance tests for ciprofloxacin resistance. Uh, in some uh, uh, countries, they have started to be used to rapidly have a result of ciprofloxacin resistance or susceptibility in order to use ciprofloxacin 500 milligram oral dose in those cases where it's still susceptible. However, uh, can I have the box also too? However, this is also a problem to use in many countries because uh, it's extremely high ciprofloxacin resistance in many countries. Uh, it shouldn't be used uh, in pregnancy, in pregnancy, and it's a uh, worry that this will further and rapidly increase uh, uh, fluoroquinolone resistance in those countries where you still have a susceptible population. However, it might be something that can save uh, the use of especially ceftriaxone for a while, but it's also a huge worry to use this because Many of the upcoming uh, new treatment options for gonorrhea are also uh, DNA topoisomerase 2 inhibitors. So we are afraid to select for uh, cross resistance with uh, new uh, drugs. It's also a worry to use uh, the ciprofloxacin molecular resistance testing uh, 
uh, for especially oropharyngeal uh, samples where you have cross reaction uh, with the commensal nice area. Slide, please. Next slide, please. So clearly we need new uh, treatment options and uh, regarding uh, reuse or repurposing of uh, previously used antibiotics or antibiotics for other infections. Uh, Tapanem has been used in some uh, sporadic cases, but it has been used uh, three gram intravenously uh, in three days, uh, which is obviously not possible for any empirical treatment of all patients. The problem is that it has a suboptimal pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics. Gentamicin uh, is clearly not uh, sufficiently effective, uh, especially not for uh, extragenital infections and requires a second drug. Spectinomycin also can be good for urogenital infection, but for high efficacy for uh, especially oropharyngeal infection, you really need a second drug. What is uh, rather promising now is that uh, after two failures in phase uh, three randomized controlled clinical trials of solitromycin and delafloxacin, we already have two new drugs uh, that uh, now have entered the phase three clinical trials. Both are DNA topoisomerase uh, 2 inhibitors, and one is soliflodacin, and the other one is uh, gepotidazin. Uh, this is very pr promising. However, still we are a bit worried because there were treatment failures in the phase two trial. So especially it's a worry that it might not be uh, sufficient for on its own for oropharyngeal infections, which are the most hard to eradicate. It's also a worry for uh, gepotidacin that it was some uh, resistance and uh, treatment failure selected in the phase two trial during treatment, basically uh, selected resistance treatment. And uh, it was clear also that for gepotidacin, some of the fluoroquinolone resistance mutations in PARC affected uh, the susceptibility. There are also some additional drugs that look rather promising that uh, are soon entering uh, the clinical phase of development, like lefamulin and uh, the summit uh, compound SMT571. Slide, please. But we need to also uh, keep in mind that it is really a long pipeline for introduction of uh, new drugs, unfortunately, uh, as estimated here in this Nature review that David has on his slide. It can take 15 years and it's a huge amount of money from uh, the initial target identification to have a product in clinical use. Uh, it is estimated that uh, for uh, five to 10,000 compounds screened, uh, only five drugs, uh, my, five drugs uh, may enter the clinical trials. And uh, uh, this is also a reason that some drugs now, uh, which is very promising, have been fast-tracked. Okay, thank you so much, um, Magnus and Tio, for doing that tag team. Um, we have a final 10 minutes, um, and we'd like to answer your questions. Um, so if you'd like, um, please put it into the chat box, and I'll ask on your behalf. Um, so there was a question from, um, from Iris um, to Magnus, um, and you, you did mention already about the diagnostics for um, determining superfloxacin uh, susceptibility. Um, do you have anything else to add on that topic? Um, so I, I also let the, um, I guess, audience know that um, we actually have a cluster randomized control trial um, using this diagnostic from SpeedX, um, which we were supposed to start at the start of the year, but obviously because of COVID, everything's put on hold. 
Um, but certainly we are trying to get some real world um, data of the, um, the feasibility as well as the value of using these um, kind of diagnostics to save um, ceftriaxone. Um, Magnus, did you want to add anything else about that? I, I don't know exactly what the question was, uh, but in general, I would say that we need to uh, continue our research basically to find also uh, appropriate targets to predict resistance to to other antibiotics. Uh, it might, uh, in some uh, parts of the world, save the trials on a bit with the ciprofloxacin resistance uh, detection, uh, but we need to focus hard on also predicting resistance to other antibiotics. And there are a lot of work, uh, especially based on genome sequencing, which also are developing very quickly currently. So hopefully in the coming few years, we will have much more data for those other antibiotics and prediction of resistance. Great. And one more for you, Magnus. Um, is there, um, oh, what are the factors that are leading to high resistance of gonorrhea to both ceftriaxone and azithromycin? Do you, do you mean uh, factors in the bacteria or in general, or? Probably a bit of both, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, the difficulties uh, with the extended spectrum cephalosporins is that, uh, firstly, there are uh, the main target gene, the PAN-A gene that encodes for the penicillin binding protein too. Uh, can have so many different uh, mutations that cause resistance and also epistatic mutations that will stabilize and support the resistance. There are also so many other genes uh, that affect efflux and influx uh, that uh, concomitantly gives uh, the resistance. So, so, so this is a main problem uh, mm -hmm. to effectively uh, predict the, the resistance and the factors in the bug. Okay, thank you. Um, a question for Tio. Um, this is about syndromic management. Um, is syndromic management always recommended by WHO? And four question marks after that. <laughs> uh, Tio, would you like to answer that? You might have to unmute yourself. Um, Theo, we can't hear you yet. Hi, I can. Oh, yes. Thank you so oh, much. Yeah. Uh, I think um, we are now in the stage of uh, revising syndromic approach uh, to STI case management. And of course, there's going to be different uh, stages of the development because in low and middle income countries, syndromic approach might be the only option. But now we are trying to look at how we can enhance syndromic approach with more etiologic diagnosis. And so that's why the initiative within WHO is really to also look at how we can have more cheap point of care tests that could enhance some of our syndromic approach uh, management uh, mechanisms and, and and this is where i think uh we are now moving forward and hopefully we can have the guidelines as soon as we have uh, in late this year great thank you so much um there is a question about this long lag time between vaccine developments um i mean with the coronavirus vaccine people are talking about 18 months um but what What's the difference with the STI vaccines? Why is it taking so much longer? This could be a whole new webinar, but um, does anyone yeah. want to, to have a, yeah. um, a go at that? I think it's the mechanism by which uh, you develop the immunity. I mean, you can be reinfected with gonorrhea several times and still you don't develop that immunity. I think that's the biggest challenge that we have. In addition to that, I think if you look at it in terms of the initiative that we have with the vaccine development, uh, there are new uh, good news in terms of uh, vaccine. You, we know that the meningococcal vaccine has cross uh, um, protection with the uh, gonorrhea vaccine. 
the big challenge also is that it is only about 35% um, protective. And so more needs to be developed in terms of uh, the vaccine development at this point. Maybe Magnus, you can add to this, uh, to this conversation. Yeah, I, I think that uh, you basically touched uh, most uh, issues. It's uh, due to the bacteria that shows such a huge uh, uh, genetic and antigenic uh, diversity, due to the lack of sufficient uh, immunity, especially when a lot of the infections are only local mucosal infections. And it also have been some uh, inhibitory antibodies that are produced and inhibit uh, the uh, a recital effect, efficacy of any immunity. So, so it's a, a lot of uh, reasons, but it has been a lot of progress in regard of finding appropriate uh, uh, conserved targets uh, that uh, most strains have, as well as understanding in detail the immunity and how to circumvent any inhibiting uh, immunity. So, so I, I think it looks uh, very promising and Sami Gottlieb and, and many other at WHO do a lot of great work with this. Yeah, so please look at Sami's um, paper in our special issues. I think she's done a really good summary of that. Um, we might have time for one more question, unfortunately. I'm not sure whether Kit Fairley is still on the call. I know he had to potentially leave early, but um, if he is, um, there's a question about Will targeting oropharyngeal gonorrhea delay further emergence of drug resistance? Uh, I can I answer, yeah, yeah, thanks, Jason. I think I can answer some of that, but Magnus may have to chime in a little bit more. So, um, I, you know, as some of you know, I, uh, I and others have been working for the last uh, almost decade and, and think we have uh, demonstrated that the oropharynx is a very important site for the behind the reproductive rate of gonorrhea in gay men. And so if you're able to do something about that and lower uh, the rate of infection at that site, the duration of infection at that site or infectivity at that site, you you may well have a, a population wide reduction in prevalence of infection. If you have a lower prevalence of infection, you have a reduced probability of resistance developing. But I think um, I'm not really qualified to answer the question about uh, acquisition of resistance in the oral pharynx, and I, I, I think probably it's best that I pass that question on to Magnus. Yeah, yeah this is uh, Magnus. No, I, I think uh, clearly, as uh, nicely described uh, during several years by Kit and his group, uh, the, the importance of oropharyngeal gonorrhea uh, is significant in the transmission of infection as well as uh, consequently of uh, resistant strains. I also think it's very important to target oropharyngeal gonorrhea because it's uh, asymptomatic, it's further spread as Kit uh, discussed, but also that it's, uh, in my opinion, rather clear that it can be the emergence of resistance because a lot of the commands and Neisseria in the pharynx uh, more easily develop resistance to many uh, drugs, including the extended spectrum cephalosporins, and they can easily exchange uh, uh, through uh, transformation or recombination those resistance determinants to Neisseria gonorrhea. And that is also why we, for the uh, currently identified ceftriaxone resistance strains, we can uh, trace back uh, the resistance determinant uh, uh, to uh, uh, commensal uh, Neisseria. So, so I think it's very important to target the oropharyngeal gonorrhea and that can affect also the resistance emergence and spread in a longer term. Great, thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, our time is up. Um, thank you um, for everyone who's um, joined us on this webinar. Um, I hope that we will have um, further kind of topics around STIs um, in the future. Um, so please watch this space. I'll leave it up to Meg and Tio um, to see whether we can organize some more of these. Um, and um, yeah, so thank you, Meg, um, for hosting um, the webinar for us. And a big thank you also for our, our amazing speakers um, who have shared their, their knowledge with us.
Um, so with that, um, thank you everyone again. Please stay safe um, and um, hope to see you at some other points. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.